Oh, hello, great readers. I'm Bill Chen. I'm Nimikum. I'm Van Chen. In this class, I'll read all of you a part of. We'll be Dick the Will. Yes. Ah. Oh. Moby Dick or the Whale Herman Melville Chab 16 The Shitsek 3 Van Bidet I am sorry to say Had the reputation of being an incredible old hunks And in his seagoing days A bit of Hard Taskmaster They told me in Nantucket. Though it certainly seems a curious story. That when he sailed the old Kattegat Whaleman. His crew. Upon arriving home. Were mostly all carried ashore to the hospital. So exhausted and worn out. For a pious man. Especially for a Quaker. He was certainly rather hard hearted to say the least. He never used to swear. They at his men. They said. But somehow he got in an ordinate quantity of cruel. Unmitigated hard work out of them. When Bildad was a chief mate have his drab coloured eye intently looking at you. Made you feel completely nervous. Till you could clutch the mething hammer or a marling spike. And go to work like mad. At something or other. Never mind what. Indolence and idleness perished before him. His own person was the exact embodiment of his utilitarian character. On his long, gone body, he carried no spare flesh, no superfluous beard, his chin having a soft, economical nap to it, like the worn nap of his broad brimmed hat. Ocho, then, was the person that I succeeded on the transom when I followed Captain Pillock down into the cabin. The space between the decks was small. And there, pulled upright, sat old Bildad, who always sat so, and never leaned, and this to save his coattails. His broad brim was placed beside him. His legs were stiffly crossed. His drab vesture was buttoned up to his chin. And spectacles on nose. He seemed absorbed in reading from a ponderous volume. Well dead. Cried Captain Pug. At it again. Well dead. I. He have been studying those scriptures, and, for the last thirty years, to my certain knowledge, how far you got, but Ed, as if long habituated to such profane talk from his old shipmate, but Ed, without noticing his present irreverence, quietly looked up and seeing me glanced again inquiringly towards Pelik he says he's our man but it said Pelik he wants to ship Dusty said Bildad in a hollow tone and turning round to me 
I just said I unconsciously. He was so intense a Quaker. What do you think of him? Bedet, said Pelek. He'll do, said Bedet, eyeing Maine, and then went on spilling away at his book in a mumbling tone quite audible. I thought him the queerest old quake I ever saw, especially as Pelek. His friend and old shipmate seemed such a blister. But I said nothing, only looking round me sharply. Halek now threw open a chest, and drawing first the ship's articles, placed pen and ink before him, and seated himself at a little table. I began to think it was high time to settle with myself at what terms. I would be willing to engage for the voyage. I was already aware that in the whaling business they paid no wages. But all hands, including the captain, received certain shares of the profits called lays, and that these lays were proportioned to the degree of importance pertaining to the respective duties of the ship's company. I was also aware that being a green hen at whaling, my only would not be very large. But considering that I was used to the sea, could steer a ship, spice a rope, and all that, I made no doubt that from all I had heard I should be offered it. Least the 275th lay that is. The 275th part of the clear net proceeds of the voyage. Whatever that might eventually amount to. And though the 275th lay was what they call a rather long lay, yet it was better than nothing. And if we had a lucky wage, might pretty nearly pay for the clothing I would wear out on it. Not to speak of my three years' beef and board, for which I would not have to pay once ever. It might be thought that this was a poor way to accumulate a princely for the end. So it was. A very poor way indeed. But I am one of those that never take on about princely fortunes. And I'm quite content if the world is ready to board and lodge me. While I am putting up at this grim sign of the thundercloud. Upon the whole, I thought that the 275th lay would be about the fair thing, but would not have been surprised had I been offered the 200th, considering I was of a broad-shouldered make. But one thing, nevertheless, that made me a little distrustful about receiving a generous share of the profits was, this for sure. I had heard something of both Captain Pillock and his unaccountable old crony Bilad. How that they being the principal proprietors of the Pequod. Therefore, though their are more inconsiderable and scattered owners, left nearly the whole management of the ship's affairs to these two. And I did not know but what the stingy old Bilad might have a mighty deal to say about shipping hens especially as I now found him on board the Pequod, quite at home there in the cabin, and reading his Bible as if at his own fireside. Now while Pelag was vainly trying to mend a pen with his jackknife, old Bilded, to my no small surprise, considering that he was such an interested party in these proceedings, Bildad never heeded us, but went on mumbling to himself out of his book. Then add up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth. Well, 
Catching Blizzard. Interrupted Pug. What do I say? Why well, shall we give this in men? Thou knowest best. Was the sepulchral reply. The 777th wouldn't be too much. Would it? Where math and risk to corrupt. Bartley. There. Indeed. Thought I. And such a lie. The 777. Well. Old Bildad. You are determined that I. For one. Shall not lay up many lays here below. Where mouth and wrist to corrupt. It was an exceedingly long lay that. Indeed. And though from the magnitude of the figure it might at first deceive a landsman, yet the slightest consideration will show that for 777 is a pretty large number. It. When you come to make a teenth of it, you will then see. I see. That the 777th part of a farthing is a good deal less than 777 gold doubloons. And so I thought at the time. When? Last your eyes. Bid it. Cried Pillock. Thou dost not want to swindle a young man. He must have more than that. 777th. Again said Bedad, without lifting his eyes. And then went on mumbling for where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. I am going to put him down for the 300th. Said Pelek. You hear that? But that. The 300th lay. I say. Bill Dad laid down his book. And turning solemnly toward him said. Catting Pug. Thou haste a generous heart. But thou must consider the duty thou wearest to the other owners of the ship widows. And orphans. Many of them in that if we to abundantly reward the labours of this young man. We may be taking the bread from those widows and those orphans. The 777th lay. Tafting Plague. Thou build out reward Pelag. Starting up and clattering about the cabin. Blasty. Catting Bilzad. If I had followed thy advice in these matters, I would for now had a conscience to look about that would be heavy enough to found the largest ship that ever sailed round Cape Horn. Catting Pug. Said Bilzad steadily. Thy conscience may be drawing ten inches of water, or ten fathoms. I can tell. But as thou art still an impenitent man, Captain Pike, I greatly fear lest thy conscience be but a leaky one. And will in the end see thee foundering down to the fiery pit, Captain Pike. Fiery pit. Fiery pit. Ye insult me. And Hast on that true bring. Ye insult me. 
it's an old fired arc rage to tell any human creature that he's bound to hell. Trucks and flames. Build it. Say that again to me. And start my soul bolts. Butter lilies. I'll swallow a live goat with all his hair and horns on. Out of the cabbing. He kenting. Drab coloured son of a wooden gunner straight wake with he. As he thundered at this, he made a rush at Bildad. But with a marvellous oblique. Siding celerity. Bildad for that time eluded him. Alarmed at this terrible outburst between the two principal and responsible owners of the ship. And failing half a mind to give up all idea of sailing in a vessel. So questionably on and temporarily commended. I stepped aside from the door to give egress to Bildad. Two. I made no doubt. Was all eagerness to vanish from before the awakened wrath of Pelek. But to my astonishment, he sat down again on the transom very quietly and seemed to have not the slightest intention of withdrawing. He seemed quite Eastern penitent Pelek and his ways. As for Pelek, after letting off his rage as he had, there seemed no more left in him. And he, too, sat down like a lamb, though he twitched a little as if still nervously agitated. Phew, he was still at last, squalls going off to leeward. I think. But it. I used to be good at sharpening a lance. When that been? Will he? My jackknife here needs the grindstone. That's he. Thank you. Did it. Now then. My young man. Ishmael's thy name. The Ise? Wallen. Dan ye go here. Ishmael. For the three hundredth lay. To be continued.